if it is learned. Uh, here, uh, you, you can still try to, uh, the model can figure out these things based on some like small color difference and some little detail difference. But uh, when it goes to SP image, so it becomes some, uh, color, just some color blocks. And uh, for this one and this one, it's really difficult to just look at these uh, blocks to, to determine which is uh, gray and which are in the background. So the model is forced to look at uh, a higher level context in order to figure out uh, how to make the prediction here. Uh, so this is one example. Another example is uh, neural structure segmentation. Uh, here, uh, this raw data and the SP image. So still, uh, the main structure, the essential structures are preserved key, uh, in the SP image. And a small example here is this, uh, uh, on the neural structure, sorry, there's a, there's a small gap here on the border. And, uh, uh, but there are still some little textures here may indicate it's on the border. So the model may use this texture to bridging the gap when doing the segmentation. However, uh, on the right hand side, the uh, SP image uh, totally removed uh, these textures. And uh, when working on this image, the model is uh, asked to look at uh, a bigger picture in order to figure out whether they want to uh, bridging this gap or not. Okay. So in, in the following of this talk, I'm going to talk about a few technical details. So the first thing is how to generate SP image. Second, second thing is uh, how to train the DR model using the SP image. And third thing is uh, I will show some exper uh, experiments uh, on four data sets. So uh, for the first one, the key issue is uh, when you generate the SP image, there's a key hyperparameter here says uh, how many superpixels you want to generate in this uh, image. So if you set the, this uh, number too high, then it, uh, the SP image will become to be very similar to the raw image. If you set it too low, then it would be uh, very coarse and uh, some essential structures might be missing in the SP image. And the uh, when uh, using these uh, new images for training, uh, so whether to mixing this augmented data with the raw data or you just uh, you, you want to separate, uh, keep them in two fo folders and uh, you, you draw these samples according to certain rules. So it's another question. So uh, finally, uh, for, uh, for experiments on four data sets. So uh, let's jump to the first one. So uh, generating the SP image from the raw data is uh, actually quite simple. You first apply a super pixel segmentation method on your image and you obtain some uh, those super pixel cells. And each cell contains uh, some pixels. Uh, you, then you calculate this, uh, for example, the mean value of this pixel, uh, pixel values uh, inside of every cell, and then you assign this uh, calculated mean back to the pixel, all the pixels inside of every cell. So you, you, you do this uh, uh, for all, all the cells and all the images in your training data and essentially you, you get uh, the SP images from the raw data. Here the key hyperparameter here is the S, is, a, uh, is determ determining uh, how many subpixels you want to generate for this certain SP image. And uh, I'm going to talk about uh, this issue and how to determine this. So uh, I already briefly talked about the so when you set it uh, a very large number, then it's become very fine, and uh, essentially it could be the same as raw data. And uh, when you set it a very small number, then it could be very coarse, and uh, some uh, structures might be missing due to this uh, uh, calculating mean and assigned back to the, all, all the pixels. So we want to find a good range in this axis so that uh, any, any S, uh, falls in this range would be a feasible choice for your data augmentation purpose. Okay. So uh, a few methods we might be used here, so, uh, um, might be useful here. So the first one is that you based on the human uh, experiments that you know uh, the image size and uh, how large the objects may vary in your image. Uh, and also the scale of your image. So um, this could be very, uh, 
uh, pretty much, uh, I think uh, a lot of times is uh, available in your medical setting. So uh, when you do the imaging part, you pretty much know uh, a lot of this information. And uh, when you apply uh, the, this data augmentation method, you can make use of this uh, knowledge when you set up this range. Another way is uh, just a, a classic machine learning way you do a cross validation on the training set to figure out this uh, parameter. But uh, a drawback of this is uh, it's uh, pretty slow and usually you need to repeat it uh, like five or 10 times to get this number. Another way is a little fancier that you just um, uh, generate the SP image at the first place and you don't care about, uh, don't care too much about whether it's too coarse or too fine. And during training, you discard these uh, two coarse images uh, if its uh, training error doesn't drop uh, sig uh, significantly during a, a time period. So basically, in this setting, you probably want to recall this uh, training error for every sample, and uh, for certain samples, uh, when uh, the training error doesn't drop, and uh, it means uh, it's too hard for the model to fit, and uh, probably you, you may want to drop this one uh, to, uh, out of the training set. So in this paper, uh, we do, uh, we pretty much rely on the first thing, the human expert knowledge, uh, but uh, for all the three 2D experiments, we use a fixed range for that. So we, we didn't uh, very uh, fine tune this thing very a lot. And on the 3D data set, we also use a, a fixed range. This range is uh, larger than the 2D one because the Im image, uh, the number of pixels become uh, more. So in the 3D setting, okay, so. Uh, second issue is how to train the model using the SP augmented data. So here we have this uh, overview of the training set after augmentation. Uh, the, the row corresponding to different version of your sample and the column corresponding to a, uh, each individual sample. So the first row is your raw data. Uh, the blue block is a raw, raw image and the black one always is a annotation. So, you, uh, what uh, we do is uh, just uh, first pick some uh, column and pick also uh, and pick those uh, raw data from the columns. Then you randomly select a version of your SP image from that column uh, to put it uh, in the mid batch. So uh, there's a constraint here. One is uh, you want to keep the proportion half and half for the raw data and the SP image. Another constraint is uh, a uh, SP image is uh, sampled only if uh, its corresponding raw data is sampled in the mid-batch. So we find out that uh, uh, through this, uh, the training can be effective and uh, uh, otherwise uh, 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 this uh, won't uh, help a lot. So you, you need to keep the uh, percentage because the, uh, the SP image potentially has a, a lot more uh, samples than the raw data. Another thing is uh, you want your SP image directly works on uh, raw, uh, its corresponding uh, raw data uh, when do the back propagation. So uh, that's the reason we, uh, we keep the raw data and the SP image in a one-to-one -one correspondence a pair in the mini batch. So let's see some uh, ex uh, experiments. So the first one is a 3D uh, hard data set, hard segmentation. There are two foregrounds uh, in this uh, data set. One is uh, the heart, one is a grid vessel. So we tested a state model called dense voxelet, uh, and uh, we, we apply a DA basic. DA basic means that uh, data augmentation, the basic set, uh, which, which includes this uh, random cropping, random rotation things. And uh, then plus SPDA, uh, we got uh, quite a lot of improvement uh, in terms of the overall score. This overall score is uh, the higher the better and uh, it summarized uh, the three metrics uh, in this, uh, this uh, columns and uh, the, the organizers has an equation to calculate this score. So uh, this is a one experiment. Another one is a 2D segmentation for glands. Uh, we, we did an experiment on UNET and the DCN. DCN is called uh, Deep Contextual Network, uh, and we show some improvement. Also with uh, DCN uh, the, uh, plus S SPDA, it achieves a comparable result to the uh, state art model, which published last year in uh, here. So the second data set. The third one is a neural segmentation data set. Uh, basically, same story. 
but here we also compare with the EDDA, which is the elastic deformation data augmentation. So uh, this data set, the result already uh, very, very well uh, for just to apply the ULAT or DCN and LAN, but still uh, we show uh, with SPDA the, in, the, the result can be further improved. Although the, uh, the number seems pretty small, uh, but we did uh, this uh, experiment five times with different random seeds and uh, we report this uh, mean performance and the uh, uh, standard deviation across the runs. So uh, we show this uh, improvement, although it's pretty small, but it's uh, stable. The final uh, experiment is an in-house data set, which is a fungus data set uh, that has uh, three full grounds, the fungus, the muscle, and the nervous tissue. This is uh, captured from uh, the antibody. Um, we show that uh, ULAT and DCN got improvement with uh, SBDA uh, quite significantly. And this is, uh, th uh, so this is the in-house data set. And actually, there, uh, let me talk a little more about this. Uh, so the fungus is a green color, one in the an annotation, this fungus. The, this big chunk of thing is a muscle. And uh, this uh, uh, bl uh, blue or purplish uh, color are the nervous tissue, which usually appear between the fungus and the fungus, or be uh, between fungus or between fungus and muscles. So. Uh, uh, there are some small green things which are another uh, uh, class uh, because it's a, it has a very small number of pixels. So in this experiment, we just uh, we, we didn't use this class and just uh, treat this class as a, a, a background or anything else. Okay. So um, effectively, for example, this nervous tissue got uh, a lot of improvement on the, uh, in the result because uh, a lot of these textures, although it's very rich, but it's not very useful or very cr crucial when you do, do, do the segmentation. And uh, the spatial relationship between this fungus and the nervous tissue are more important and the more stable uh, features. So uh, by removing these textures, uh, the model can uh, encourage of or forced to focus some more on this uh, larger scale information. Okay. Uh, I think that's it. Thank you very much. So, do we have any questions? <laughs> so, thank you for the talk. Uh, perhaps I missed this. So when you're doing the uh, super um, pixel, you're averaging the images, and for the mask, you're doing doing the same thing too. No, no. Yeah. So how? how do, that's yeah. a re uh, so the thing is uh, that's the reason you, you want to keep this range in a, a proper range uh, when you generate the super pixels. So you uh, because uh, when you want to keep something fixed like the annotation, so that uh, the raw data the change is uh, in in the range that it's not too much that uh, it violates the uh, annotation map. So uh, the reason why I didn't change the annotation map is be mainly because that uh, it, uh, it would, uh, the super pixel actually will change the annotation. If you change the annotation, it will change it quite a lot sometimes, especially on the border. So uh, it's, uh, it's not good. I, I, uh, actually, without changing the annotation, uh, you form a kind of like many to one mapping or transform. So you, you enforce the model to learn this kind of uh, transform. Otherwise, it's, uh, actually, with the experiment, it doesn't work uh, well if you change the annotation according mm -hmm. to the super pixels. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay. Thank you for a great talk. Uh, it seems that in all the examples that you show, the real goal is segmentation. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was hoping you can give us an intuition about why super pixelization would be a good first step as opposed to just trying to segment the images. Uh, so your question is uh, whether using super pixels for this, uh, or the more, uh, could you repeat your question again? I'm sorry. It seems that in all the examples that you demonstrated, yes. the real goal is segmentation, not super pixelization. Yeah, yeah, sure. So that's the reason uh, the title says uh, uh, super pixel uh, for data augmentation uh, in biomedical image segmentation. So the, the, fo uh, the focus mm -hmm. is uh, to using super pixel to help uh, having uh, to, to train a better deep learning model for segmentation. Right. Okay, thank yeah. you. Thank you. Uh, 
Thank you. And also, I have a question. Uh, have you compared your result with some old-fashioned clustering approach? Uh, for example, using density-based clustering, yeah. rather than using a kind of a specified the number of clusters, uh, which is artificial anyway. Uh, very good question. So this uh, SuperPixel method uh, called SR, I say is based on clustering actually. It's uh, uh, based on the color, uh, pixel color information and the uh, spatial relation of these pixels. And they form a feature and then just do the clustering on the feature space. So uh, the density based uh, clustering, I would, I would say could be very similar to this clustering method. So the clustering method they use is a, 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 like just a, like an iterative thing, uh, it's just a heuristic method. So it should be similar to a density based method. Uh, in some sense. And uh, the reason why using SuperPixel is uh, SuperPixel is known to be uh, very good in preserve these uh, 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 boundaries and contours uh, in the image. So, and usually uh, form a kind of over segmentation map. So uh, we think that's good for uh, preserve a certain uh, essential structures in the image. And it also, I think a dense, a density based uh, clustering, usually you need to define a, a kind of window for when you're calculating this density. So that window could be uh, problematic to set up also. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for your talk. Um, OK. I was interested, sorry, so I have still one question. I was interested in how do you apply your model in, the, in test time on, on a new image? Okay. Do you have to perform also this super no. pixelization? Or no. you apply the model to the original raw image? Uh, no, you just apply the model usually, just use the raw data. So, so basically, the uh, SP image uh, uh, train a model which uh, focuses less on the uh, small, tiny details. And when you use it, you still use the raw data. Yeah. One uh, re related question from me. Uh, over here. Uh, um, yeah, it's, um, it's a bit related to the, to the question. So I wonder if um, you, you've shown that uh, using the simple pixelized version um, of the image during training uh, helps, helps a lot in improving the, the segmentation. And I wonder, did yes. you carry out experiments uh, during inference? So providing the super pixelized uh, image as well during inference? And uh, do you have um, results or a general remark on that? Yeah, good, good question. We tried it. Uh, actually, it doesn't help a lot, because uh, the super pixelizing part will introduce some error. So the model will always work uh, less accurate on the SP image. And when you mix uh, this result, for example, you do some kind of uh, ensemble of the uh, result from raw data and from SP images, the result always downgrade uh, comparing to the using raw data. Uh, but uh, there could be a chance that uh, you, you may use uh, some other uh, weighting method, like uh, weight the raw data more and weight uh, SP image less during inference. But we haven't tried this further. Yeah, thank you. OK, thank you. Hi there, uh, down in front. Uh, down in front, trying to get an intuition about why the, uh, yeah. why the process works. Can you comment about the data augmentation that was used uh, that you're comparing your baselines to? And it, in each case, it said uh, augmentation basic. Um, did you use elastic deformations and rotations? And yes. what types of augmentation did you use? So the DA basic used in all these uh, data uh, experiments are uh, random cropping, random rotation, and sometimes uh, random flipping. I think flipping is also used. But pretty much just uh, uh, rotation. Rota rotation is the, the, the main one, yeah. Um, but no elastic deformation? I'm sorry, elastic? No elastic deformation. Oh, so elastic deformation, basically you uh, generate a, a grid mesh, and then you uh, do some random uh, changes on the mesh, uh, and then you apply this mesh back to the image. So uh, this uh, distort, these uh, things uh, uh, locally, but uh, it doesn't uh, uh, remove any textures or details. It just uh, uh, basically change some shapes. Yeah. Okay, I think we'll have to stop the questions now. Let's thank, thank the speaker you. again.